Today, brothers and sisters, we are going to look at the 21st chapter of the book of John. We're going to start here in what many Christian scholars consider to be the appendix or the epilogue to the Gospel of John. And there is some very important information in this 21st chapter. We find an episode that occurred after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the third mention of Jesus Christ being with his disciples after the resurrection that is recorded in the Gospel of John. So at this point, the disciples who are mentioned in this 21st chapter, they have already seen Jesus in his resurrected form and glorified body. So Jesus being alive and walking around after the cross and after his burial is not something new to the disciples. Now, John records Jesus appearing to Mary outside of the tomb, and he records two other instances, each eight days apart, of Jesus appearing to his disciples at a house where they were gathered together. This instance of Jesus appearing to his disciples, not while they were gathered together in that house, seemingly waiting, but with his disciples engaged in their old profession of fishing. Now, this is important because the disciples, Peter, James, and John, were professional fishermen. That was their previous trade. That is how Peter provided for his family, his wife. If we recall in Luke chapter 5, Peter and the other disciples had a similar incident of being out all night fishing and not catching anything. In the Luke 5 account, Jesus comes upon a group of fishermen who would soon be his disciples and he gets into Peter's boat and tells Peter to launch out into the deep and cast his net on the right side of the boat. Peter being the professional fisherman and having fished all night long and not caught a thing, politely objects to Jesus' request. Nevertheless, he follows the instructions that Jesus gives him and when he casts his net out on the right side of the boat, he catches a net breaking boatload or several boatloads of fish because Peter had to call his friends to come help him haul in the fish that were caught in his net. After this incident in Luke chapter five, Jesus tells them, his disciples, or the fishermen who would soon be his disciples, in verse 10, he says, And so also were James and John, sons of Devedee, Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Or in other translations, it says, you will be fishers of men. In other words, brothers and sisters, Peter, James, and John were being called to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And their call is not unlike the general call that every Christian receives. A call to come out of and to go into namely Christ. Every new Christian or convert is to come out of the world and to enter into Christ, the newness of life that we have in Christ. The Apostle Paul calls it taking off the old man and putting on the new man that we have in Christ. But this call that the disciples would receive 
is a little more important than the general call given to every Christian. Because these men would soon be the apostles of Christ with the task of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire world. They would be the first church of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus would describe them on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. The partnership that Peter, James and John, fishing buddies, business partners, that unity that they had previously as partners in business, that was the same unity that being in one accord that Jesus Christ describes as being the foundation that he would build his church upon. Stones fitted together to form a structure, being in one accord. And there they are, Peter leading them. In John chapter 21, back into the activities of their old profession, not being fishers of men as Christ had called them, but being the fishermen who they used to be in their soon to be past life. Because as of yet, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come, had not yet happened. So their new life in Christ as apostles, fully empowered with the Holy Spirit of God, was just a few days or a few weeks away. They're being fully born again and baptized, not by water, but by the Holy Spirit was on its way. We see it in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Now, with these disciples, soon to be apostles, the question is, should they have been out fishing, especially in the manner that they were? Because Peter and the other disciples were showing the same exuberance for fishing that they were when Jesus met them. And I think it is right for us to draw a direct parallel to what occurred on the night and morning Jesus called his disciples in Luke chapter 5 and the night and morning that we see occurring in John chapter 21. But before we continue, brothers and sisters, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds, so that we may hear your word. Heavenly Father, we ask for your word to come into us and change our hearts and minds according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus calls his disciples, particularly Peter, James, and John, fishing partners and fishing buddies, they had a night that most people who fish would consider to be an unproductive endeavor, spending all night and spending all of that time trying to catch fish and not catching anything. And we learned if we compare the two days, that day in the beginning when they first received the call from Jesus Christ, and now at this midway point and ending in John chapter 21, these two fishing incursions with the act of fishing as a profession being central, a divining characteristic of these disciples' lives. That's who they were, past tense. They were professional fishermen. Peter, James, and John, and a few of the other disciples. But it was Peter, James, and John that Jesus took up to the Mount of Transfiguration. 
It was these three disciples that Jesus decided to give a deeper revelation and insight into who he was. They had the chance to see Moses and Elijah at the top of the mountain where Jesus was transfigured into glory. It was these three disciples. They were considered the inner circle of Jesus close disciples, the twelve. And as we look forward from this point in John chapter 21. The apostles, not just Peter, James and John, but Paul and all of the other apostles, they would have a very special role in founding and building the church that Jesus Christ began at the cross with his death, burial and resurrection. And the miraculous catch of fish in both instances, in the beginning when Jesus called them to the ministry and at this point in John chapter 21, right before they are filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, a few days or a few weeks later. And it is important for us to look at the use of divine power in they're not being able to catch any fish all night long in both instances, in Luke 5 and in John 21. We should consider both circumstances, the miraculous catches of fish and the divine intervention in them not being able to catch any fish for the entire night on both nights. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that the minutest details in this universe, they are under the sovereign power and direction of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. On that morning when Jesus would first call these disciples to the ministry and apostleship, that first wave of human talent that would blaze a trail in the world and in building the church of Jesus Christ. That is the position these disciples were called to on that first morning in Luke chapter five to be world changers. Jesus even said as much that you will be fishers of men. The exact words being from now on, you will be fishers of men. Brothers and sisters, that was the call. That was the directive from their Messiah, from their Lord, from whom we learn to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, they did not know who Jesus exactly was at that point when they received that calling. And from now on, it would be safe to say that they still did not completely understand the importance on a global scale, the call and position and which they received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Acts chapter one, on another occasion, when Jesus had appeared to them post resurrection, they are asking their Lord, is he going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? Meaning the nation of Israel as they understood it in the Old Testament. These disciples were looking for a King David or another Hebrew king to rule over the people. Just as the Roman government was ruling over both the Hebrew and Gentile societies and regions in the world. They were still looking for a political and secular kingdom of the world. In Acts chapter 1, and Jesus tells them, that the time and hour of his returning to establish a new kingdom and not necessarily an Old Testament type kingdom, but to bring the rule of heaven into the earth as Lord of Lords and King of Kings would come at a day and an hour that only God knows. 
And the exact reply of Jesus to his disciples questions in Acts chapter one is this verse seven. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So, brothers and sisters, we see that the disciples of Jesus Christ were a little confused about their mission and their position in the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has went to the cross. He was buried and he rose on the third day. The disciples and many other people had spent nearly three years with Jesus Christ during his ministry in the earth before the cross. We now know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is bringing salvation to the entire world, not just the Hebrew world, but to Gentiles also. And that's what scripture calls us, Gentiles, the non-Hebrews. The disciples who were first directed to only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in their ministry training. They are now directed to go out into the entire world and be fishers of men. This gospel action, their missionary training to go out into all the world, that's their calling. But we find the top three disciples, along with a few others, falling back into the practices of their old life. Peter says in John chapter 21, I'm going fishing. And while that may seem like a good idea to put off idleness, to engage oneself in a noble endeavor. Because it says in scripture that they were just waiting around as Jesus told them to do that the helper would be coming, the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. Because in Acts chapter one, it says that Jesus was appearing to his disciples and others over a period of 40 days after the cross. And at his last appearance, he says to his disciples, in only a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And upon this baptism, you will go out into all the world to proclaim the kingdom of God and be a witness for Jesus Christ. These disciples would be the first ambassadors of the kingdom of God, which was established by Jesus Christ. So if we look at the big picture, the action of the disciples who went fishing in John chapter 21, a few days or a few weeks before they are to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And for you and I, brothers and sisters, that may be the salvation experience, not a water baptism, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we experience when we learn that we are saved, when we feel it, when we experience it. And on the day of Pentecost, the disciples and many others who were with them on that day Scripture says that about 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They were speaking in tongues and in languages that all men could understand in their native tongues. 
And Peter spoke boldly. He preached with boldness to the community that day. Now, John says that they caught 153 fish that morning in John chapter 21. And that is what they were looking to do. Being professional fishermen to bring in a large catch of fish. So that they would have money and be able to take care of themselves and their family and run their business. It was a nice catch of fish. In fact, it was a great catch considering the circumstances. But if we fast forward to the day of Pentecost, when scripture tells us that 3000 people, not fish, but people received the message of salvation. Now, in hindsight, if we go back and look at their actions in John chapter 21, just a few days or a couple of weeks before they are baptized by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They're going back to their old profession of fishing. And it is not just that they were fishing, but it was the exuberance, the dedication at which they were doing it. Peter was back into his old element. They had no problem staying up all night fishing. But when it came time for them to stay up and pray, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was to go to the cross, they had to be awakened time and time again just to stay up to pray and to watch. But this was not the case when they were fishing, back doing the things that they were used to doing, engaged in their old life. The scripture says that Peter had made himself comfortable. He had taken off his outer cloak. Some scripture translations simply say that he was naked. In other words, he didn't mind getting dirty. He didn't mind getting covered with the smell of fish and fishing. Any type of protective clothing or cloak that they may have been wearing, Peter had taken it off. They were not catching any fish anyway. But Peter and the other disciples, they were in the zone. They were back doing the things that they were familiar with. They were back doing the things that they used to love. They were back into their old profession, their old ways. And they were able to do it all night long. Like I said, they didn't have a problem staying up fishing. But when it came time to pray, to watch and pray, when their Lord is about to go to the cross that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is troubled, the cross is approaching. When evil is about to strike a devastating blow to the potential savior of the world. These rudimentary beginnings of the early church, the foundation that Jesus Christ is about to lay. Scripture calls it striking the shepherd and the sheep will flee. But it wasn't so much as evil striking the shepherd as it was God doing what was necessary in order to save the world. The lamb had to be slain. But for those three days that Jesus lay in the tomb, scripture describes the principalities and powers of the world the dark forces seemingly celebrating this temporary halt of salvation. The halt of salvation advancing throughout the world. But on the third day, 
when Jesus rose from the dead for all the world to see the book of Colossians describes it in chapter 2 verse 15 it says and having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross brothers and sisters the victory of Christ over sin and death was done right out in the open not only for the spiritual principalities and powers to see but for the whole world to see the salvation of God in Jesus Christ but if we get back to what the disciples were doing in John chapter 21 which with such great things that have already occurred Jesus rising from the dead and the great things that were promised to come the Holy Spirit the bringing of salvation to the whole world we can see that the disciples actions in the midst of such great and divine things occurring in the earth are not unlike our own we go to church we watch televangelists on the television we participate in a salvation prayer or maybe even an altar call and then we go home or we turn off the TV or change the channel we may have even been moved by a sermon or a message of faith we may have even felt the Spirit of God move in our hearts and our minds. But for many of us, we go right back to fishing. We go right back to our old profession, our old ways of doing things. And we go back to them with exuberance, with the same zeal and dedication that we have always had. Just like Peter and the other disciples who were with him that night. They did not have a problem staying up all night long doing what they used to do. And neither do we have a problem putting up with what we have to put up with in our old way of life. We deal with the secular pretensions of morality. We deal with the ways of the world as we always have, as a member and citizen of this world community and society. When in Rome, we do and behave as the Romans. Even though it was Peter who would write that we are to be foreigners and strangers to this world, sojourners, just visiting from a different land with different customs. The Apostle Paul describes it as possessing a citizenship in heaven. So brothers and sisters, when do we make the transition from the old man to the new? When does our zeal for the ways of the world begin to wane and our desire for the things of Christ and our new life begin to thrive and mature? When does it become harder for us to go back to the things that we used to do? Why is it so often that we return to our old ways like a fish to water. That is what Peter and the other disciples did. Jesus had called them to be fishers of men. And even though they had experienced firsthand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they returned to their old way of life with the same level of exuberance and zeal as they have always had. And if it were not for the divine intervention of the Lord to deny them success in catching fish that night, and both nights, remember they didn't catch any fish on that first night when Jesus called them to the ministry. Jesus is managing and maintaining his group of apostles, keeping them together, 
keeping them in the path that they should travel. And that keeping them in the way that they should go entailed denying professional fishermen the circumstances of catching any fish all night long. In other words, they had to be cut off. Their personal endeavors, their profession, it had to be addressed. They had been and they are being called to do something else, something for the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation of this world. And we too, brothers and sisters, are called to be lights in this world. We are to be guiding lights before men so that they can see our good deeds, good deeds that glorify our Father in heaven. And we all have a desire for the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, and shelter. Jesus tells us that our Father in heaven knows that we need these things. Our Father in heaven knows the things that we want and desire that are good. And if we go to the book of Genesis and look at the garden that God prepared and designed with all manner of plants and vegetation that were pleasing to the eyes and satisfying for food to feed Adam's flesh. Brothers and sisters, it was a beautiful garden that God had purposely designed just for Adam, just for a man. Jesus describes the care of God for men and women as how much more. In his teaching, Jesus said, if God feeds the birds of the air and God beautifies the landscape with flowers and all manner of colorful vegetation, how much more will God feed and clothe human beings? who are greater in relation to all of these things. And Jesus had also trained his disciples in real time concerning their need, their needs for security, concerning their fear of being taken care of, their worry. In the initial missionary training exercises, Jesus told his disciples to not take a purse and to not take a change of clothes or another pair of shoes. And when the scripture says they were not to take sandals, brothers and sisters, that does not mean they were to go barefoot. In Luke chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 10, the 12 disciples were sent out first and then Jesus sent out another group of 72 missionaries. And one of the lessons that they were to learn, because Jesus gave them a quiz later on in Luke chapter 22, verse 35, it says, And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. You see, brothers and sisters, we're all subject to be concerned about our daily bread and how we are going to pay our bills. And rightly so, because in the next verse in Luke chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus tells his disciples, but now, now that I will be gone and your mission now switches from just going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to going out into all of the world. Some level of preparation is in order. But that first principle that you learned on the first missionary journey, that you lacked nothing, that you were divinely being taken care of. Brothers and sisters, we are to never forget that. We are to always look to God as being our source. 
And we are to always look at ourselves as being God's servants. And as God's servants, God will take care of us. And I always like to tell this observation and my perspective concerning children living in their parents' home. As a child grows up in his or her parents' home, from a mere infant to an adolescent, in general and normal circumstances, when that child is able to open the refrigerator door, food and drink is always present. It may not always be the things that the child may like, the cookies, candies, and potato chips, but there are always nourishing food items and drink items present in the refrigerator. Every time that the child opens the door to the refrigerator, in their mind, magically, there is food there. And the child grows to have an expectation of food and drink items being in the refrigerator. Oftentimes, they may begin to examine and search for something new. They think to themselves, I wonder if something new is in the refrigerator or in the pantry or the cupboard. Some may even think it is a game. They open the door and then shut it. And then a few seconds or a few minutes later, they open it again, maybe thinking to themselves, something new may be in there that I may have missed. It may have popped into the refrigerator. A child or an adolescent is often not aware of or simply does not pay attention to how groceries and supplies are brought into the house by the parent. In other words, they don't have a connection. They don't have an experience in paying bills, in working and earning money so that they can afford to buy groceries, pay the light bill and other bills. A child and an adolescent, for the most part, are unaware of these things. Just like Adam when he was placed into the garden, the world as he knew it and experienced it was already up and running. There were fruit and vegetables already on the trees and shrubs in the garden. The animals were running around and everything that he needed was right there for the taking. And he had a relationship with his creator, his God. They would walk together and talk together in the garden. Just as Jesus would walk and talk with his disciples during that three year ministry effort in the earth. And the disciples like children. It is never mentioned in the gospel where they were concerned about what they would eat or what they would drink or where they would lay their head for the night because Jesus did all the planning and Jesus did all of the providing either by natural means or by divine means. We should not forget the times when Jesus fed multitudes of people with just a few loaves and fishes. So the disciples had experienced being taken care of, all of their basic needs being met as ministers in training for Christ. But in verse 36 of, 36 of Luke 22, Christ tells his disciples, he said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. We learn then that reasonable preparation is in order 
as Christian ministers of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, that is not just for the apostles of Christ. That is for us today. We should be connected to our local and global church communities in such a manner that we see our participation and our giving aid as being vital to the progress of Christ's agenda in the world. Brothers and sisters, Christ said that all of us who profess to be Christian are to be lights in this world. Our lives as Christians are to be a witness to this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that way, brothers and sisters, we too, as servants of God in Christ, can have the reasonable expectation of lacking nothing as far as it concerns our basic needs in the world. The example of the over one million people that left Egypt during the Exodus, because scripture says that it was 600,000 men, not including women and children in the Exodus from Egypt. God took care of this community of people and in their 40 years of wandering in the desert, scripture tells us that their sandals did not wear out, neither did their clothes. There was always plenty of food and water for them to eat and drink. So brothers and sisters, how much more will God take care of those who possess the redeeming spirit that comes into us when we are born again in Christ? The prophet Elijah was fed by the ravens and had a fresh spring of water to drink through or drink from during a drought in the earth. And the exploits of Joseph in the land of Egypt during a seven year famine. That shows, brothers and sisters, that God protects and provides for community, societies, and world governance during adverse situations in the world. Brothers and sisters, all throughout scriptures, it is recorded that the people of God have always been taken care of. Even when we may transgress, God provides a way of repentance and a way of escape. So while we may have a desire to look out for ourselves in this world, to worry about what we are going to do, how we are going to eat, and I am sure that that was a factor in Peter's mind and in the thinking of the other disciples, because Peter had a family, he had a wife to take care of. It is always good to know when that next check or when that next job or contract is coming up. And we can have a certain level of confidence and a sense of security knowing that paying work a net full of fish is right around the corner but when Jesus tells them to cast the net on the right side of the boat because up to that point they have caught nothing they haul in 153 large fish, more than a day's wage for all of the disciples and for those who are taking care of their families. Because when they get to shore, Jesus already has breakfast ready. The scriptures tell us that fish and bread was already there waiting for them when they got to shore. And brothers and sisters, that's the beauty and majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ and our God. They know what we need. They know what is best for us. Our creator knows what's pleasing to the eyes and to the emotional disposition of the creation that he created. 
our first priority should always be to seek the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us that everything else will fall into place if we endeavor to diligently seek first the kingdom of heaven. And while it is noble to fill our idle time with fruitful endeavors, let us not be caught in the snare of falling back to our old ways of living, particularly depending on ourselves without giving our relationship as servants to our Lord first priority. We can so easily be lulled back into our old ways of living and doing things. In this case with the disciples, it took a divine intervention of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, to again prevent them from being successful in their worldly endeavors as professional fishermen and not as fishers of men. Brothers and sisters, we are given talents, abilities, and also responsibilities and duties from our Lord Jesus Christ at the moment we come to salvation. The disciples of Jesus Christ, the twelve, were given the task to be the apostles of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. This was a grand endeavor and position that even the disciples having walked with Christ and experiencing the miracles and divine power wielded by Christ in the earth, they could not even completely fathom and understand their calling. And even today, brothers and sisters, we often do not understand the gravity and importance of our individual calling from our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, each of us is an important member of the body of Christ. And we can often become distracted by the daily and weekly responsibilities and duties of this present world that we have grown accustomed to. We set goals for ourselves that are of this world. We have priorities for ourselves and our families that are based in this present world and not necessarily of the world and the kingdom of God that is to come. So we may find ourselves just like the disciples going back to our old ways of doing things, our old perspectives of the world in which we live. And while the desire to go fishing that Peter and the other disciples had, it seemed important to them at that time in John chapter 21. Remember, Peter had a family, a wife to take care of. The other disciples likewise had responsibilities and personal desires to fulfill. So engaging in the act of fishing, their old profession, it seemed like a good thing to do to alleviate some of the personal concerns and worries about their lives and the people's lives who were connected to them, be it family, or even the other disciples who were with them waiting on Christ. What were they going to eat? What were they going to drink? What were they going to wear? How and where were they going to live? How were they going to provide for themselves? I'm sure they were thinking these things. But when we see Jesus at the shore, a fire of coals is lit. Bread has been baked and fish cooked and ready to be eaten. Brothers and sisters, this breakfast prepared by Jesus was waiting on the disciples. When they got finished pursuing a human and ordinary solution to their concerns and their worries, 
We have to remember brothers and sisters And so should the disciples have remembered That they had been called to serve Christ They had been called to a worldwide agenda To be the first individuals To bring the salvation of God to the world there is a valuable lesson in looking at the breakfast that Jesus prepared and had waiting for his disciples. Christ had called them to come and go out into the world to bring repentance and salvation to a dying world. And brothers and sisters, we too in Christ have been called to carry on that mission. And Christ, too, has also prepared for us breakfast with a cup running over set before us in the presence of the challenges and enemies that may attempt to prevent us from fulfilling not our mission, but the mission of God in Christ that has been given to us. That special little detail, breakfast waiting after a hard night of pursuing worldly endeavors, trying to alleviate our reasonable human concerns, seemingly we being and working apart and bereft of God's agenda for our lives. The disciples actions that we see in the gospel are an instruction and an insight that we can use today. Many of their mistakes and faux pas are recorded and presented to us as an example and a solace when we find ourselves possibly going off mission and getting our priorities out of order. But what we find, and as this scripture presents to us, that Jesus is right there with us, guiding us with a rod of correction when needed, and lovingly preparing breakfast for us when we finally come to our senses. Brothers and sisters, Christ told us that we should become like children in order to receive the kingdom of God. In other words, we should be like that child waking up in his or her parents' home to the smell of breakfast cooking in the morning. Everything that we may need for the day's work and agenda is being prepared for us by our Father. And while we may have had a rough night, maybe even a nightmare about the past or the future, when we wake up to that smell of breakfast being cooked by our Father, just as when the disciples saw Jesus on the shore calling out to them, and when the disciples finally come into His presence, he has breakfast waiting for them. Brothers and sisters, that is our Lord. And every day for six days of the week, the Lord rained down breakfast, manna from heaven for his people. Brothers and sisters, our Lord and our God, they know what we need. They are more than willing to provide what we need as we fulfill the duties and responsibilities that are given to us as servants of our Lord and our God. While the task of possessing salvation in Christ for ourselves and also in bringing it to the world, it is not an easy task. In fact, it is a God sized task. And we are merely servants of our Lord. The work has been finished. And now it is simply time to begin the harvest, to go out into the world and collect the lost who have been chosen to be saved. Brothers and sisters, that smell of breakfast cooking in the morning should always cause us to remember the love of our Lord and our God. It should also remind us that we have a responsibility and a duty to bring the salvation that we possess personally to a world and a society of people who have been led astray and deceived. 
And I pray, brothers and sisters, that our eyes and our ears be open so that we can see the grand task that is put before us as Christians. Heavenly Father, make us to be mindful of your will for our lives. Heavenly Father, help us to put your priorities first ahead of all of the agendas that we may have crafted for ourselves. Before we came to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, help us to see the great things that you have called us to. We ask that you empower us and to send us encouragement and guidance when, when and where we need it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and all of the things that we have done and are doing and may do in the future. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for your spirit that is with us and in us. And in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and say, Amen.